Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, opportunity to explain our work. So, um, well, the, the more honest title to the talk could be S matrix bootstrap for effective field theories. But, uh, well, I guess my, my collaborator, Pedro Vieira, is a bit of a marketing specialist, so he thinks this title is better. So where is string theory? And, uh, and in fact, I think Pedro, both Pedro and Andrea are here in the audience, so they, they can help me if, if there is some, something that I need help to explain. So, so, but the idea is very general, is just to try to use the general principles of the S matrix, um, namely causality, analyticity, uh, unitarity, and Lorentz invariance, to try to constrain uh, effective field theories. Okay, and we we have studied the case of flux tubes, so these two-dimensional pho um, phonons, or we have studied the case of massless pions, which I I think I won't have time, but if I have, I can also explain. And today I will focus on this case of supergravitons. And we are also working on, on photons, so on the Euler and Eisenberg Lagrangian. Okay, so, um, so that's, the, that's the story. So the talk will be quite, quite concrete. So I will just explain very concretely what is the problem in terms of supergravity 2 to 2 scattering amplitude. And then in that context, I will explain this general algorithm of the numerical S matrix bootstrap. Okay, so I will review the basic ingredients that we use to, to obtain bounds on the effective field theory. Okay, so let me start a bit for a, a bit more of big picture. How did we how did we arrive at this S matrix bootstrap? Well, uh, well, at least myself, we, we came from the context of the conformal bootstrap. So there we, it was very successful. We just imposed the set of consistency conditions on a physical observable, like a four point function of a conformal field theory. And from there, we can really bound severely the space of conformal field theories and even obtain high precision critical exponents. And so the question is then, what about massive quantum field theories? Can we also do the same for that case? And, uh, and of course, that led us to the old idea of the, of the S matrix bootstrap. If you want our novelty is to try to approach this question in a more algorithmic way, and also with a numerical component to really try to systematize the constraints of the S matrix bootstrap on the space of quantum field theories. So, so this is, if you want, the slide of the parallel between the conformal bootstrap and the S matrix bootstrap. And um, yeah, I think the main point here is the fact that is here on the conformal side, the four point function is the natural observable to study because it only has a function of two variables, two cross ratios, while here, the natural uh, function to study is the 2 to 2 scattering amplitude because it's also a function of two independent variables, two Mandelstam invariants. Okay, so of course, you could also try to study directly the four point function of local operators, but that's a much more difficult object in a non conformal field theory. Okay, so, so that's you want a better analogy in terms of complexity. And today we're going to extend this framework a little bit because I don't know, I mean, it's not quantum field theory. We're going to be talking about quantum gravity. We don't know the UV completion. So we only know that in the IR, we will be studying gravity as an effective field theory, plus some higher derivative corrections. And we want to bound the Wilson coefficients that control the size of these higher derivative corrections. Okay. Okay, so, but this is a very general question. So for simplicity, we will study the maximally supersymmetric case where uh, uh, yeah, all, all the technicalities of having to deal with graviton elicities and polarizations are uh, simplified by my maximal supersymmetry. Okay, so if you want that's a bit of uh, big picture uh, philosophy, now 
I will start concretely explaining what was the problem we, we tried to address. That is, if there is any question, yeah, please interrupt me at any time. It's better if you, if you ask questions uh, as we go along. Okay, so, so then concretely. So we'll be working in 10 dimensional maximal supergravity and uh, we will be focusing on the two to two scattering of the supergraviton multiplet, okay, the graviton multiplet. So the simplification I, I was alluding to is expressed in this formula. So the point is that all um, components in the super graviton multiplet, two to two scattering of any of these particles is described by this simple formula where R to the fourth is just a prefactor that it's independent um, of the Mandelstam invariance. I mean, it's completely fixed uh, by, if you want, by three level supergravity. And then all the non-trivial interactions of the UV completion, if you want, are in a single scalar function of the uh, scalar Mandelstam invariant. Okay? So S, the usual ST and U, which of course sum to zero in this case because the external particles are massless. So this is the function we want to study. And um, in particular, we know some things of, about this function from uh, precisely from effective field theory. So for example, if you compute this function in uh, supergravity, it's uh, given uh, just by this formula here. So I'm defining here, so it's, this is gonna be useful. So let me introduce it right away. This function T, which is just S to the four times this function A, which is fully crossing symmetric. Uh, it's just a scalar scattering amplitude, which for example, in type 2B would be the scattering amplitude between two charge scalars, two complex scalar fields like the axi diloton in type 2B, which in supergravity, they just have these contributions from graviton exchange in the T and U channel. So this is just the, the pool you get. And this is useful because as we shall see, unitarity for the full multiplet is equivalent to unitarity of this scalar amplitude. Okay, so in practice, we will just impose unitarity of this scalar amplitude when we impose unitarity. And then the what we so this part is universal the way it starts, but what we want to focus on is how it uh, is the corrections at low energy, so the ones that are encoded in the higher derivative corrections, and the first correction is this one that appears here as a constant. So let me already show you how does it come about from the effective action point of view. So in, in maximal supergravity, the first non-trivial correction to the einstein hilbert term comes from a Riemann to the fourth term and the coefficient, well, for us, we're going to define alpha precisely by this formula, but it appears here with some coefficients. Okay, so we always define our effective field theory coefficients directly from the amplitude, from the physical amplitude, because that's what we really have access to in, in bounding. In fact, we can we can understand. So you, I don't know. If, you could wonder why does it jump, right? Why does it go from one over STU to a constant? Why don't you go uh, step by step, which would correspond to the R square correction and R cube correction. But, um, well, that follows for supersymmetry, from supersymmetry, but it's also clear from already everything I said, because, well, maybe I can explain that in real time. So, so the next term would be, for example, let me let me just place it here. An intermediate term between these two terms, so the term of order R square, just by dimensional analysis will be something like one over ST plus one over SU plus one over uh, TU. Because it has to be fully crossing symmetric. That's, that's just crossing symmetry of this function A of STU. And the next dimension would be this one, okay? 
you cannot put one over s squared because otherwise you would have double poles, which is also incompatible with the analyticity expected of the scattering amplitude. Okay, so this would be some coefficient times that, but it turns out that this, if you just, uh, this is equal to zero, if you, if you use this constraint that one over, that s plus t plus u is zero. Okay? So this doesn't give you anything. And well, now for completeness, if you put the next term, the one, the one that would come from one over R, sorry, curvature cube, R cube terms, this in principle is not zero. However, this will give you terms in the scattering amplitude in this T. So this would give T, uh, T would contain a term like S to the four over T which corresponds to the massless particle of spin four, which is also not uh, present in supergravity. So this is also forbidden. Uh, okay, so this is also forbidden. Okay, that's why it jumps. So it's, but as I said, it follows our supersymmetry that imposes, uh, that imposes precisely this structure. So Jean, can I ask, so, is, is the statement that the R squared terms, which would have given you that thing, happen to not contribute to the to this particular scattering amplitude, or they're just not present in the supergravity Lagrangian? They are there, but they the don't argument, go. yeah, the argument I gave you, um, the argument I gave you would be just that they cannot contribute to this right. amplitude. Right. Uh, I believe they are they are also not present. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the argument I gave you would not allow it. I see, and, and and you explained that you don't that there's some expected analyticity properties such that you wouldn't have a double pole. Could you explain a bit about that? Why, why is yeah, it? So, so here, here I'm very good. So analyticity is the if you want the most subtle subtle axiom if you want on the S matrix bootstrap because it's supposed to impose to correspond to causality. But there is some non-trivial step into really only part of the analytics that we use can be really directly linked to causality. And that's in quantum field theory. In, in, in gravity, it's even harder. So, so, so in practice, the analyticity we use is the analyticity you get to any order in perturbation theory. So, so if you do perturbation theory in supergravity, you will see, well, you will get simple poles from the exchange of massless particles, and then you will get logs, branch cuts coming from loops, right? And multiplied by powers of Mandelstam invariant. And so all of this we allow, but we don't allow anything else um, apart from uh, the analytics that would appear in perturbation theory. Thanks. Well, I mean, the positions of the cuts, right? I'm not committing to the precise behavior of the branch points that you predict in, in perturbation theory, at least not at arbitrary I order. Okay. Okay, uh, so, so that's, um, that's the observable we're gonna focus on, okay? This parameter alpha, it's just a number. And the question is what values can this parameter alpha take in a consistent UV completion of supergravity? Well, there are some UV completions we know of uh, supergravity. So we can ask what, what is alpha in those theories? So in, in, type two, in type 2B supergravity, alpha is given by this non-homorphic Eisenstein series of the complex string coupling, complexified string coupling. So it's a very explicit expression and you can plot it. Okay, so you can plot it in the fundamental domain of tau and you can see that the minimum value of this alpha in type to be supergravity is uh, about 0 0.14, okay? We don't have more precision than that. So let's, let's round it up to 0 0.14. In type 2A supergravity is simpler. So actually type 2B and type 2A they have the same perturbative expansion in, in, in G string, but type 2B on top of this has some non-perturbative uh, effects, instanton effects. 
And in fact, so you can also plot for type 2a and you see that the minimum is again 0 0.14, okay? Well, at first, as I said, these two numbers are different, but very, very close. So that was a bit surprising to me. But yeah, I think the, the explanation comes from this fact that it is known that 2a and 2b just differ by these non-perturbative effects and they turn out to be small even at the value of, uh, if you want, at the, at the strongest possible coupling where alpha is minimized. Okay, so this is just uh, what string theory tells us that is possible. So we should not be able to exclude values of alpha bigger than 0 0.14 because otherwise we'll be excluding some string theories which we believe they are healthy if we compute them. So another thing we know is that alpha must be positive. Okay, so this follows from a simple dispersion relation formula, which I'm not deriving here for you, but it's, it's a simple contour argument. Um, and well, we have to assume that T does not grow too fast at infinity, but that's also expected. And, um, and alpha is given by this integral over the imaginary part of T, which is the total cross-section from, from the optical theorem. So this must definitely be positive. Okay? You could worry that this might be a diverging, divergent sum rule because you have here one over S to the fifth. So it's very uh, enhanced in the IR, but you can compute this imaginary part using uh, one loop diagrams in the effective field theory. And uh, the imaginary part starts as S to the fifth. So this is perfectly finite in the IR and also finite in UV because of, uh, you want a bound in the in the regi in the regimen. Okay, so so the status is this one. Okay, we have all real values of alpha to start with. Then we have an analytic argument that forbids all negative values. So this we know there cannot be a good UV completion here. Here we know that it's string theory, so it must be good. And then we have a little gap in the middle, which we don't know. Can it be recompleted or not? Well, I guess to this audience, the answer must be no, but more generally, we, we just don't know. We don't have an, a, an independent argument of string theory, why alpha cannot be between 0 and 0 0.14. So George, just a very quick question. When you say there's a garden above 0 0.14, um, some values presumably can be realized. Do you believe that all values can be realized? Well, for uh, if you allow me to vary the string coupling, you see it's really, I can go from 0 0.14 to infinity. Actually, you can even just go at weak coupling. You see at weak coupling, as G string goes to zero, this alpha diverges. Except if you, if you I don't know, if you, yeah. Good, okay, and you're in 10 dimensions, so you're not worrying about, uh, okay. Yes, this is in 10 dimensions, yes. Thanks. In 11 dimensions, it's it's much more interesting, but we haven't done the numerics. Yes. That's, uh, yeah, let's discuss at the end. Okay, any other question about uh, the status? So this is this is where we are, and, uh, and now I will uh, try to explain you what we did to address this question using as matrix bootstrap uh, technique. So one question I have is uh, your, your dilaton, of course, is also part of your supergravity, but you're not, you're viewing it as a fixed parameter in your calculations? So, so it's, yeah, it's both things. One, the dilaton, if you, if you mean the VEV, the constant background, yeah would be this would give this value of g string so you you can choose any any value a given value of of the diloton gives but, you g string but that's part of supergravity multiples that you're talking about right the scattering you can talk about scattering of that uh, diloton so that's one one role is a background another role is as a particle as you say as a particle yeah i just treat it as another particle in the multiplet and uh, so it's also described by this uh, by this amplitude in, in particular, this T is the, um, is the scattering amplitude of the complex scalar, the axidiloton. Right, but you have nothing to say about the different waves of it from your approach, because you have to go to higher point functions. Is that what? 
Right. So the the web just fixes the value of uh, g string. Right. And then here I'm just computing scattering of the fluctuation. So so in other words, you will not be able to say the, the power loss or what the power structure is what it is because you're not studying higher higher scattering amplitude for the axiom. Right. So here it's only two to two. Okay. We are limited. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So that's uh, that's the status. So if there are no further questions, I will explain now how to address it within uh, the S matrix bootstrap uh, methods. Okay. So so the point here is that there is an algorithm. Okay. I will explain it specifically to this problem, but the arg algorithm is really more general. And uh, there is basically three steps. Well, the way we proposed it, our our proposal. So the first step is that we just write an ansatz, okay? and this ansatz uh, is satisfies immediately all these properties exactly. Okay, so this is not an approximation; it's just Lorentz invariance, crossing symmetry, this maximal analyticity that I was saying, that corresponding to, to the analyticity of perturbative diagrams, and it it has the low energy behavior predicted by the effective field theory. Okay? So this, we will just write it. I will show you in, in two slides how we write it. Then step number two, we impose unitarity. Okay? So here, the best we can do is to just write the unitarity constraints on each partial wave, but we cannot really solve it. Okay? So that's where we have to appeal to a numerical algorithm. And so what we do then in the last step is okay, in this case, we minimize that, okay, we optimize some variable, but the algorithm really works well if the variable is linear in the scattering amplitude. For example, alpha enters linearly in the scattering amplitude, so it's, it's perfect. Okay, so let me give you just a bit of qualification on this algorithm. So there is one important thing is that the ansatz will have some finite number of parameters which will grow with this n. So capital N will be a measure of how much freedom you have in our ansatz. And ideally, we want to send this n to infinity so that we can really cover the full space of S matrices compatible with these properties. Okay? So this is one parameter that is very important in our algorithm. Another parameter is that we cannot impose in the computer infinite number of constraints. So we truncate the constraints of unitarity up to a maximum spin L okay, in, in the partial waves. So this L is also supposed to go to infinity at the end. And, uh, and this has the opposite effect because it increases the number of constraints. Okay. N increases freedom, L decreases freedom because it increases constraints. And so that means we actually have a fourth step, which is the extrapolation. Okay. We have to do this for any fixed n and l, and then we have to extrapolate so that we get results that we really trust as bounds that uh, have some any meaning in, in the full space of, of uh, amplitudes. Okay, so that's the logic. Now let me give you some details about each step. So step number one. Step number one, the basic idea is this picture, okay? The idea is that we take a function of Mandelstam invariance, S, T, and U, and uh, we extend that to a function of three independent variables, S, T, and U. And then in each variable, let's say S, for example, the reg region of analyticity is, is the entire complex plane minus the cut from zero to infinity, okay? Here it's zero because it's massless particles. You had a mass gap, it would be from 4m squared to infinity. So if you have this analyticity on the cut plane, you just, the trick we use is we just map this cut plane to the unit disk. So this is this row map that I'm showing here. And now the function in terms of this row variable is analytic in the unit disk. So we can approximate this function by a Taylor series around the origin. So we just write a triple Taylor series Rho s, rho t, rho u, raised to powers, a, b, c, integer powers. And this triple Taylor series is, a, is the approximation to the function. As n goes to infinity, you in principle can approximate any function 
that is analytic in the product of these three unit disks. Okay, okay so that's the basic thing. I probably for you that if you don't want to do the numerics, that's probably enough. If you want to do the numerics, there is a few more details. For example, here, because supergravity had this factor here, one over STU, and actually this T amplitude was multiplied by S to the four, it's convenient to factor out this power such that at large STU, this also behaves like one over STU. And so the, the large energy behavior of these ansatz is more under control. It doesn't grow so fast at large energy so that you, it's easier to impose unitarity afterwards, okay? Yeah, and there are other properties, for example, this prime correspond to some, we remove something because some of these monomials, rho s, rho t, rho u to a power, they are not all independent because of this constraint, okay? So this constraint in terms of rho variables is a polynomial constraint, so we also, use that to remove, but these are kind of details. The point is really to do this conformal mapping and then write, if you want polynomials in these row variables. Okay. So this allows us to explore a very large space of uh, uh, S matrices. And in principle by N going to infinity by exploring uh, the full space of S matrices with this analytics. Okay, so this is step number one. Step number two is unitarity. So I already mentioned this, but uh, just want to give you a bit more details. So this, this prefactor, so recall that the amplitude for the full multiplet is some prefactor, it's bold R to the four times the scalar amplitude. And this prefactor obeys this identity. Okay, so if you sum over the two particles, all the polarizations of the two par intermediate particles, it reproduces itself times a factor of s to the fourth. So that means that if you start from this unitarity for the super amplitude, for the amplitude with all the components, it implies that this scalar amplitude A obeys this kind of unitarity, which is equivalent to saying that the T amplitude, the amplitude for complex scalars, obeys just standard unitarity for scalar particles, okay, where D leaps is this. Lorentz invariance, phase space integral, okay? So, so in practice, we just impose unitarity of T and that's very simple to do because, sorry, this is, yeah, this is the formula. So you just take your T amplitude, you write it in terms of the energy and the angle. So X is cosine theta. You integrate with the appropriate Gegenbauer polynomial for 10 dimensions and that's your partial amplitude. And partial amplitudes, the square of partial amplitudes are probabilities and probabilities have to be less than one, right? It's a probability of going from two particles and ending up in two particles. So you see that's a infinite set of quadratic constraints on the amplitude T, which was linear in the parameters. Okay, so sorry, I, that I forgot to emphasize. Let me go back here. Yeah, this word is the most important word in this slide, I forgot. So this alpha ABC, okay, so these are some coefficients of this Taylor expansion. These are the free parameters in my answers. So these are the variables over which I will optimize, I will minimize the, the target uh, alpha. Yes. Okay, and, uh, and the unitarity is a set of quadratic constraints in those parameters. Well, so one, yes. one basic question. So when you are imposing all these constraints on the amplitudes, I should understand that, that what you are doing is to impose these nice properties, unitarity and so on, on the UV completion, right? But you are not imposing anything on the effective field theory in the infrared. No, not right? at the moment, no. And are you imposing, is, is hidden here that the completion is weakly coupled or things like this? No. There is no there is no assumption of free coupling. You see the. Um, I mean t this amplitude t that I'm uh, parameterizing here can become large as, as it starts small just because of the effective field theory, right? The amplitude goes to zero as the energy goes to zero, but that's just it's really a physical property of gravitons. But then as the energy increases, 
this function can be large. Can be, I mean, it can be as large as you want, as it wants. The only boundary is unitarity. It's just we. It's just not going to infinity because we we bounded by unitarity. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so last step that I was saying is that how to make these uh, conditions a finite number. So one I already explained, we discretize, we, we truncate the spin, the total angular momentum to some capital L. We also have to put a grid, we put a dense grid for values of energy. So we, we impose in a for many values of the center of mass energy. But this we do a very dense grid and we try very various grids. So here we are confident that our extrapolation to continuous S is, uh, is reliable. Okay, so here the extrapolation is a bit more under control. Okay, so that's step number two. Now step number three is the numerical part. It's like you give the computer this set of quadratic constraints and this is a optimization problem of the type of semi-definite programming. So we can use the code STPB developed by David Simon Suffin for the conformal bootstrap. Okay, so we can use exactly the same code uh, to, to do the optimization problem. And here are the results. So here I'm showing you the results for a given value of L and a given value of N. Okay, so as I said, so this is the important part. So as N increases, so N increases, the colors go to red you get more freedom. So if you have more freedom, you can realize a smaller alpha, right? We're minimizing alpha. On the other hand, if you increase L, you add more constraints, so it's more difficult. So alpha mean increases, okay? So that's why you see the curves growing with L and decreasing with N, okay? that's expected. And now step four is the extrapolation. So here you can already see that extrapolating for infinite L is not too difficult because the curves are getting flat, right? So you're basically extrapolating these horizontal lines and you're saying this is basically the value. So we did it a bit more carefully. So we fit these very flat lines with inverse powers of L. And, uh, and for each value of N, we extrapolate to L equals infinity. Okay, so this is, maybe I can show you here. So this is these points, okay? So this, you see there's an error bar because we do different fits. We do like power laws and exponentials and we choose different sets of points. So we choose different sets of fits to have an idea of the error in the extrapolation to infinite spin. So you see here. And then once we have for any N the extrapolation to infinite spin, we extrapolate to infinite N to the maximal freedom. Okay, so here it, if you want, there is a zoom of what is down here. And uh, well, the best we can do with the current numerics, well, I should say that these numerics are, are really non-trivial. I think if it was not uh, the ingenuity and the perseverance of, of Andrea Guerrieri, we would not really be able to finish this. So, because you see, we have to go to very large spin. So this is already done in a, in a computer cluster. It's not, it's, not, it's not an easy problem numerically. Uh, so we get, well, the final result you see down here, we get something which is 0 0.13, but the error bar is still pretty significant. So we get something compatible with string theory, okay? So if you want, we get something compatible with the, the string lamp post scenario, right? So, so this is the this is the result if you want. The summary is here in this slide, in this picture. We had something forbidden rigorously. String theory told us that it could be here only. And now when we do the numerical of S matrix bootstrap, for every finite n we can realize some value of alpha, but it's always a bit bigger than 0 0.14. And then we really, if we try to extrapolate to n equals infinity, we seem to come to very close to 0 0.14, but of course it would be great to have more numerical precision to, uh, to make sure if there is some space in between or if there is some, or if really it coincides with the prediction from string theory. So, it, but at least at the moment, it looks compatible 
to say that uh, uh, just the basic principles of S matrix uh, theory also imply that alpha must be bigger than 0 0.14 and therefore just everything that is realized in string theory is, um, is covered. That string theory covers all the possibilities by consistent UV completion. So yeah, maybe this is like a pre preaching to the choir here, but yeah, this is, the, this is what came out of this. Okay, so um, any question? Let me give you just a few more details of how this works in practice. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask something? Sure. Uh, so when you do these kind of things, it's often the case that at critical points, right, you can learn something more about the spectrum of the theory. Yeah, so that's what I'm going to tell you now. Very good, excellent question. So yeah, one question you may ask is, we had this sum rule that alpha was some integral of the total uh, cross section of this imaginary part. How is this actually satisfied in this, uh, in this extremal theories when we have minimal alpha? Well, as I said, this is a difficult numerical problem. So I don't know the final answer. Let me show you what we know now. So I show you here the curves for n equals 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And then in red, I show you the maximal n that we could attain, 24 which is already like 400 parameters, okay? It's a lot of, a lot of parameters. So one thing you see is that, so we can predict how this um, integrand starts. So as I said, from it's a one loop computation. So it starts as a constant and we can predict a constant from one loop effective field theory. And you see that this, this red line, although we did not really impose that it had to start like that, we did not impose the effective field theory behavior at one loop, we only impose the three level effective field theory behavior. It is, it wants to go there, right? You see that there are these oscillations in our ansatz, but it wants to go there. And then the main feature is that most of the contribution to this sum rule comes from this peak, which, uh, which well, I'm already saying here that it corresponds to a resonance, a scalar resonance, but we really see it. So this, I can show you here. If you look at the phase shift in the spin zero channel, the spin zero two particle states, you see really a resonance. So the phase shift crosses uh, pi over two around this value of uh, S around three in, in Planck units, which is also the value that you have here close to this peak. And um, and this is, this is the lightest resonance we see, but actually in our numerics, we see more resonances appearing at higher spin, but it's very hard to make them converge, okay? So we need, N needs to be even larger. And that's one of the reasons we think the numerics is so hard is because the optimal solution uh, wants to put many resonances for every spin. And this will require higher and higher powers of these uh, polynomials. Okay, so this, it's, uh, it's funny, yes. Sorry, uh, uh, can I briefly ask, so are these resonances forming some sort of regi tower or something reminiscent of a string theory? It's hard to say, yeah. To say. We see them appearing for all spins, so it's natural to think that they organize in a regi, regi trajectory. Uh, but it's, so it doesn't look linear in, uh, in spin, okay? So it, it's more like you can predict, the scaling can more or less be predicted by just, uh, so for every spin, you use three level to compute uh, the beginning, I mean, how the low energy behavior of each phase, each, uh, phase shift. And then you see, well, when phase shift goes over the one in the three level approximation, you say that should be a resonance, okay? And that gives you some non-trivial power of the spin. I forget if it's three, three halves or something like that. Okay. And, and we see more or less this behavior, you see, but it's kind of consistent because we are just UV completion, completing the, the three level theory. And so it, that's the minimum thing it can do to put resonances at that scale. 
so so can I understand this as, as some sort of extended object or is there any geometrical interpretation of such a tower? No, I mean, not that I know of. You, you can speculate, but I, I, I don't know of any, any interpretation of that kind. Okay, thanks. So let me just mention that uh, last year, the, there was this paper that they, they actually came up with this word gravibol. They, they were doing, they were also trying to uniterize the three level graviton scattering in four dimensions using some QCD techniques some approximate techniques to, to get unitary partial amplitudes. And they also found that naturally this, uh, this scalar resonance appears. So it's, um, it was found before. Okay, I think this is all I wanted to say. Now I had some discussion about future work. I don't know if there are some other questions about what I said so far. Okay, so discussion, part of it we already mentioned. So of course, other space-time dimensions would be very interesting, and especially D equals 11, because in D equals 11, the, the story goes more or less through, but there is only one value, right? If you measure these corrections in, in, Planck, in 11 D Planck units, like we are doing here, alpha will be a number, I believe it. And so this would be much more striking if somehow the asymmetric bootstrap would only be compatible with this number. Um, so yeah, we, we, we are trying to set up the numerics to try to play this game, but, um, but from the S-matrix bootstrap, I, I think it would be very surprising, but we, we will see. Of course, you can also think about lower dimensions and then you have more parameters because you have like uh, properties of the string compactification, the radii and all that, that contribute to alpha. So it even, it's even non-trivial to compute exactly what is the minimum alpha once you, once you allow that. And D equals four, which would be very interesting, of course, it's problematic because in D equals four, we really don't know what is the right observable because the amplitude is infrared divergent. So, so here we really have a conceptual difficulty to, from the start. Another thing that we are looking into is to see what happens if you impose some inelasticity. Okay, so here, uh, this is something I didn't say, but um, well, at least at low energy and low spin, it seems that the optimal solution, the one with minimum alpha, is trying to saturate unitarity in the two to two scattering channel. So it's not producing particles, it's just going two to two, it's mostly elastic. There is inelasticity at high energies, but it's unclear if that will stay or if it's just an artifact of numerical effect. Okay, so more likely that's, that's the case. That's what has been happening in the past that as you increase numerical precision, inelasticity gets pushed to higher and higher energies and to higher spin. So there is a question of, can we actually input some known elasticity, like for example, the inelasticity that we know from black hole production and that will change the elastic, sorry, that will change the unitarity condition from saying that S squared is less than one to saying that S squared is less than E to the minus the black hole entropy, right? So for, which is a very small number as energy increases. So can that affect the value of alpha? So this is also something we, we want to do. Yeah, and another thing is this, Wilson coefficient. So we just did one. So we had one parameter and one string coupling. But if you look at higher derivative terms, then you'll start to have alpha and know, beta gamma more effective field theory coefficients. But everything is just a function of the string coupling still. So from the S matrix bootstrap point of view, you will have you're gonna put bounds not in a one-dimensional space, but on say a two-dimensional space. If you look at two Wilson coefficients. But string theory is just a line in this two-dimensional space because it's just this string that varies. Or okay, let's say tau, okay, if, if it's a complex, complexified couple. So, so it's also, it would be very interesting to see how this, uh, how this bounds in this higher dimensional space uh, work to see if we observe the same thing. Okay, not, not, no supersymmetry would also be very interesting. There was this very recent work 
on the three level, basically three level scattering. So here with the, with the, the non-perturbative setup that we are using, uh, well, it's a matter of work to set it up with all the polarizations, but I think there is no conceptual obstruction at least uh, above four dimension. And the final thing I want to say is this primal versus dual. Okay, so this is some technical term in the optimization, this semi-definite optimization problems. And so primal is what we did, is when you actually construct a solution that realizes the minimum value we're looking for. And the point is that as you increase numerical precision, you, for example, if it was this alpha, you get smaller and smaller alpha. But there is, there is what's called a dual approach where you don't construct the solution. You construct like a functional that excludes some values of alpha. Well, if you want the, the sum rule we had was a, a dual method, but only excludes negative values. Okay? But it should be possible to make this systematic. And there is a, a lot of work happening in that direction. So very recent paper in, in four dimensions, but for massive theories. So it would be good to adapt this work so that you, we can use a dual method here so that we can really find this bound numerically approaching from above and below. Okay? And moreover, usually the dual methods are more efficient numerically. So it should be faster. Well, so that you know that for sure you are aware of there is immense activity in this kind of bounds on effective field theories uh, from other groups. Let me just emphasize that these other groups, they are using only the linear version of unitarity, this positivity, okay? We are using this non-linear. Of course, because they are using less, they can do a lot of things analytically, but um, we are using more and that's why we have to do it numerical. So it's unclear at the moment, how much more constraining power you gain by doing uh, this full nonlinear unitarity compared with this uh, positivity. So this is also something for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>